delighted that you have found the Mindset Mentor Meets podcast. I'm Angela Cox, your host and indeed the Mindset Mentor, and I'll be interviewing executives and founders at the top of their game to find out what lies beneath. I want to know what makes people proud, how they define success, what holds them back and indeed what drives them forward. This is authentic and natural conversation with the best in the business. So listen in, enjoy and if you love what you hear, please do leave a review. And now over to today's guest. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Now, if you have listened before, you will know that we have spoken to leaders in the corporate world. We have spoken to leaders in sport, in professional services, and many an entrepreneur. But today, I have a first for you because today I have a leader from the world of academia. Now, this might be triggering some of your limiting beliefs. It certainly triggers mine, those of us that didn't go to university the first time around. But I have with me today the marvelous Dave Cooper, who I heard speak just a few weeks ago. So we've never met face to face. He is the professor of management and economic development. And he's also the head of the business school at the University of Chichester. And he's joining me today on Zoom. Dave, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, Angela. Really pleased to be here. And, you know, it's fascinating how these connections are made, isn't it? You know, we just did a presentation to the Chamber of Commerce, and I was sort of reflecting on the fact that it was probably about 15 years ago that I did my first presentation (laughs) to the Chamber. And a lot's changed since then. But it's great to be with you. It is my first ever podcast, so it's always good to have new experiences. Oh, it really is. And we're both doing a first then in that case. And it was lovely to hear you speak because one of the things that I felt that you did really well that evening was just make academia human and accessible and not frightening. And I think that's the thing that kind of shone from you and and the reason why I wanted to connect with you and do this today. Because as I was explaining just before we came on, this is all about the human being behind the leader. And you are a leader in terms of what you do at the business school and very much want to get to know you and what you're all about. And we do that through the mechanism of you sharing your proudest moments. So I asked you to have a think about that. And I'd love to hear what the first one is. And we can dig into that and see where we go. Okay, so a really novel concept. I love it. But I suppose for me and my colleagues at the university, we're really very lucky because we get to see every year our graduates crossing the stage and receiving their graduation certificates in front of their families. And that is just such a privilege. Mm. For me, that has to be the proudest moment. But what's even better is I get to repeat it at least once a year, probably (laughs) twice a year. So what could be better than that? It's like children, isn't it, coming to fruition? You know, we kind of all want the best for our children and you've got that time after time after time. It must be an amazing feeling. But of course, we've just had COVID and that impacted my graduation from King's in that I didn't have one. And that was all I ever wanted was that cap and gown, Dave. So it was quite disappointing. How did you manage that at Chichester in terms of, you know, allowing people to have that moment to celebrate? Well, you know, for us, we share that belief that you need to have that experience. And so what we did was we just waited. Yeah. This year, we invited all the graduates that were not able to go through that graduation ceremony. They could all come along. And it was just amazing. We did it in August and then we did another one just last month at the cathedral in October. And it was great to see people that Mm. we hadn't seen for 18 months. It was even better. And it was just such a a wonderful experience. It really is a very, very important thing for Mm. our students. And we we recognise that. 
Yeah, it's that moment to shake your pom-poms, as I like to call it, yeah. after so much hard work and graft and just be able to look at what you've achieved and, and celebrate that with your peers as well. So, yeah, I love the fact that that's one of the moments that you cherish. And I'm sure that you've helped many a person get to that moment. What about the people that don't reach it or that want to bow out? Because often with the impact of the change curve, we get to a situation where things become uncomfortable when we're trying new things and it's easy to dip out. So how would you manage that? That's a really difficult one to address. And sometimes, particularly with the business and management subject area, you find that students often engage with business and management because their parents want them to do a degree and they don't really know what direction they're headed in. And that's not uncommon at you know, the age. That of, age, yeah. Absolutely. You know, there's very few of us really, really know what we want to do. Some do, absolutely, and they're, boom, they're off. But a lot don't. And so sometimes, and it can be really quite early in the process, students realise this isn't for me. Mm. And so we talk to them. And actually, my view is that if a student is taking that view, it's a very positive decision because they're taking responsibility for their future and their mm. learning. And so we would support them in that. Well, I would never try and persuade a student not to follow what they want to do to take their own mm. decision. What I would do is make sure that they're taking the decision for the right reasons. And so we would go through this, you know, almost like a, a SWOT analysis. Yeah. I am business after all. And talk about, the, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And we just try and make it happen in the most comfortable way possible. I think that the hardest one to deal with is where a student really is trying to succeed, wants to continue, but just doesn't have the ability. Mm. And we do get that. And again, it's really a, a case of, of supporting them through it. So that's quite hard. The okay. biggest issue we have, which we've had more of recently in the last 18 months is the the mental health issues of course and we've seen a, a significant increase in that in in young people obviously it's been prompted by covid by the fact that they're perhaps at home in isolation but not with their colleagues in a supportive environment and so whilst the university we provide a huge amount of support to students in that space it can be very very difficult to deal with that keeping the motivation going when life becomes so small. I think most people have found that difficult, regardless of what we do or how old we are. That point that you were raising before about how you help manage a student go through that transition and make the right decision. I feel that's so important because I speak with people in a coaching environment who, you know, are established leaders now and, you know, maybe they're they're 40, 50 years old and, and often they're carrying a sense of failure because they dipped out of university. And, and often that is held in their parents' view as a failure. So that idea that you're able to interject at that moment in time where they're making these life-changing decisions and help them to look at that in that more holistic way and, and make informed decisions, it's really good to hear because there is a massive impact on people later on in life when they do that, that they don't really appreciate at the time of the decision. Completely. And one of the things we emphasise is there's always an opportunity to come back. Yes. You know, when you're ready for it, when it's Absolutely. right, come back. Why yeah. not? Yeah. And being a mature student is really cool. You know, I've really enjoyed the experience. So yeah, encourage people in well, like love, that. We absolutely love mature students because they come with so much experience that they've been mm. able to bring into the classroom and almost sort of strengthen the relevance of what we teach. Mm. And one thing, of course, we're doing is, you know, we do postgraduate work as well, of course, so it's not just undergraduate. And we run an MBA programme and a, yeah. a Master's in Leadership and Management programme. And there we're getting students coming in who perhaps haven't had previous experience of university, but have got the level of experience and knowledge that we can bring them on to a postgraduate programme. And again, that's just fantastic to be able to work with them on that. Yeah, they almost got that MBA by experience before they come and do the paper version. Yeah, they've been to the university <laughs> of life. <laughs> How many times have we heard that before? So we've got this first one about kind of seeing the students through to that moment of mm -hmm. pride themselves. And that's one of your proud moments. So what would 
the second one be? I suppose from a personal perspective, then the really proud moment was giving my inaugural lecture as uh, a newly appointed professor of management and economic oh. development. Even my kids came along to oh, that. Oh, wow. Um, even they thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> How old were they then at the time? Probably, oh, I don't know. They would be in their early 20s, mid 20s. And how many people were there then watching you deliver the lecture? Probably about 60 or 70. Oh, wow. And of course, it was colleagues and sort of people from throughout the university, but also from the region as well, because I'm involved in a number of regional economic development organisations and so I've got a reasonable contacts around businesses. So there's quite yeah. a few of them came to. So that was really good. Well, really good. But let's talk about imposter syndrome in that moment. Okay. Because we know from, you know, in the commercial world, people talk about imposter syndrome all of the time. And, and I hear it mostly from females, but I know that males experience it too. But you're going out there as this kind of newly qualified professor talking to lots of people in the room who, I'm sure I've, you know, been to lectures before. How does that feel for the first time? And, and how did you kind of manage perhaps some of the nerves around that? Oh, it's really scary. <laughs> you know, there's no two ways about it. It is a scary thing. And I always say this because, of course, you know, one of the things we're talking to students about all the time is how you present. And they also, you know, we're so nervous. Said, how do you get over it? I said, well, you you know, even now I get scared, get nervous about certain situations. And I said, what you've got to do is practice. Yeah. You've got to rehearse. You know, if you're giving a presentation to lots of people that you've never really engaged with, you've just got to prepare. That type of situation, you've got to be really structured and there's a certain style to it. But equally, I think you've got to come up with something that's humorous, just get people on your side very early in the process. And once they're on your side, you're away. Yeah. And, you know, you're flying. And I suppose uh, I'm a little bit of a performer. No, Dave, I didn't see that at all. <laughs> and so, you know, you you sort of bring that in and you start every every lecture you run, every lecture I deliver is a performance in some mm. And again, that's what we're trying to get across to the students and the people we work with. But the idea of imposter syndrome, probably suffer from it every day. I still think, you know, should I be in this place? Should I be doing what I'm doing? Yeah. But I think that's not a bad thing, actually. No, it's great. It makes sure that you're always on the top of your game. You don't yeah. take things for granted. And so, you know, I think people look at it and think, oh, it's a negative thing. It doesn't need to be. I think it's about being honest with yourself, mm -hmm. understand why you're there, but equally try not to let it impact on your relationships with other people. And I guess with age and experience, you tend to relax into things a lot more. I suppose I'm probably more comfortable speaking my mind to power. And that's probably the key thing that's different over the last few years. Ooh, that was a statement. Speaking my mind to power. So are we talking there about kind of hierarchy? Yeah. yeah. And again, that's often a fear that I hear in that kind of corporate arena from leaders. And then often the reason why they will stifle their authenticity. So there's something about what you've said there in terms of, and I couldn't agree more, in terms of imposter syndrome being a positive thing in that, you know, it, it kind of creates that humility and that keeping us on our toes, which I like. But also what's marvellous is hearing a professor from academia saying that it's a normal part of every day, because of course it is. We're all designed to have that doubt seeded in us. And yet, so many people out there in the world of transformation are talking about the fact that we need to eliminate it. We must overcome it. And actually, I believe that we just need to learn to manage these things because they're normal. And if we're telling everybody the, the story that we've got to get rid of it, when we don't get rid of it because it's normal, then that makes us feel like a failure. So hearing Dave Cooper say that imposter syndrome is a normal part of everyday life, gives us all faith that it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really like that. You know, it's a really powerful thing that you've just shared. And 
you know, it's very humble of you to share it. <laughs> so there you were giving your lecture and I'm sure you've given many more since and kind of become this performer. And that's one of your proudest moments. You talked about your children in there briefly. Are we able to sort of say, have they followed in your footsteps? To a degree, yeah. I'm very fortunate. And I suppose, you know, a proud, it's not a proud moment, but I'm very proud of my kids. And I'm Mm. always, you know, delighted to watch their development, as I'm sure most parents are. My eldest, he's done his PhD. Um, Oh, wow. What in? He's a computational microbiologist. Like, oh, I haven't got a clue what that means, yeah. but it sounds really posh. Yeah. He's got his own business. He's based in Canada at the moment and oh, wow. using advanced computational techniques to support drug discovery in the area of hard to treat cancers. Wow. God, that so, is something to be proud of. Yeah, so he's doing some fantastic work. Definitely, if you want somebody young to talk to, he's the man. <laughs> If you want somebody young to talk to. How do you cope with him being in Canada? I mean, that's like miles away from you. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Because I mean, I moved away from home at 17 and I queued up outside the telephone box to talk to my parents yes. once a week. Really both, Zoom and FaceTime are amazing things. You know, I was talking to him last night. You could have been in the room. The only thing is I can't give him a hug. Yeah. And that's what you do miss. Uh, yeah. You know, COVID was particularly challenging because, of course, I didn't see him for over 18 months. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you look at everybody else, I would still think of myself as fortunate. And he's following his dreams. And that, mm. and then I'm lucky enough to have twins. <gasps> no! Yeah. So my daughter and son, they're 24. My son's also in the States at the moment. He's a digital nomad. So he's sort of wandering around the world working because he can because he can connect Ah. and he works in again in computing around using fairly advanced computing techniques in the civil engineering world so he's good and then my daughter who I'm most proud of is an actor (gasps) what kind of actor what does she do immersive theatre so she's working on something that I'm here's the classic professorial moment I haven't got a clue what it is, but I'm told that The Money Heist is a really popular program on sort of Netflix and stuff like that. And there's a, an immersive theatre version of it in London, and she works on that. Oh, that's amazing. And that must have been so challenging for her through COVID as well, because, I mean, everything just shut down, didn't it? So how does she keep herself going she was that? Passive. She got a job at the Nightingale Hospital in London for a while. Yeah. But at the same time, she effectively got involved in all these online performances and online game quizzes and stuff like that. So she was pretty much fully employed throughout the whole period, which was amazing, really. Ah, so lovely. So three children. Yeah, all got that entrepreneurial spirit. That's brilliant. And what about, have you got a good lady in the house as well? Well, I was divorced, but I'm now engaged. That's oh, really cool, isn't it? that's really exciting. So a wedding in the pipeline. Yeah, we've got to work that through yet, but hopefully next year. Oh, I love that. I love a good wedding. We need yeah. more of those now after COVID as well. Hopefully. Congratulations. Thank you. So there you see, I, I always find out everything, Dave. This is what happens. <laughs> I can understand what. <laughs> well, let's have a look at proud moment number three then. What have you got? When I was at Cap Gemini, I was the program director at one point within the telco sector, and we were delivering a billing system for Cellnet. Okay. Are they still around, Cellnet? No, well, they are, but they're called O2. Ah, there we are. Okay, so it was BT Cellnet, and Cellnet was sold and became O2. So it was pretty big. It's Mm. a really big company. But delivering the billing system, the particular challenge was that we had to deliver it before the turn of the millennium. Oh. Because if it had gone over by even a day, it would have caused absolute chaos. Because the old billing system used, as most systems did, used a two-digit format for the year. Yeah, I remember this. 
I was in RBS and it just caused months of planning chaos to try and get the systems updated. So we were brought in because their previous attempt had failed. And so we had 18 months to deliver this humongous building system. We had 180 people working in Leeds on this. And you were the programme director. (laughs) How many late nights was that then over that time? A lot. (laughs) (laughs) I was up there on a weekly basis, as you can imagine. And of course, we had people working all sorts of hours, lots of them living in hotels, travelling into this temporary office. To the extent we ran one of our fantastic marketing program on the back of it and we talked about basically special people and so we created these vignettes of people that had done special things oh. different things For like that, recognition as, a, as, a, as an example we've got one technical architect who been wrestling with a problem for a couple of days and the particular evening concerned he'd gone to a fancy dress party as a chef and suddenly Halfway through the party, you worked out how to solve the problem. (laughs) During the timeout moment. Yeah, so he went back to the office in full chef's (laughs) regalia and sorted the problem out. And so what we did was we got a photographer in and they came and took these photos. And they had this photo of this guy as a chef and lots of other really great stories. And we did a launch in our London office. We took over the ground floor. And in the windows, we had these photos blown up to about three three metres high. And we brought lots of people in, including the guys themselves. And that was just fantastic because it was a great advert for what we were doing. Great stories that we delivered on time. And so that was a pretty good moment for me. I bet it was. And there's that human aspect to that, isn't there, around, you know, getting to the end result, yes, but actually recognising that it's people that make it happen and celebrating them and what they're about. I want want you to kind of put me in your shoes, though, at that kind of, you know, the moment when you realised that it had all come to fruition and you delivered because the pressure must have been enormous. Yeah, the moment, yeah, relief. (laughs) It's the only way to describe it. It's just pure (laughs) relief. You've done it. You've achieved it. And to be honest, most people after that, of course, you know, there's there's almost never a single moment because you you hit the moment when it all goes live. But then there's a lot of follow up training activity, development activity. So it, it sort of gradually declines in terms of the involvement. But for most of us, it was relief. And, you know, and then you've got a period of just you've got to recover. Totally. I mean, it's just full on. And then, yeah, yeah, that kind of step back a little bit. Inevitably, there is an element of satisfaction as to a job well done. And then you move on to the next one. You did Capgemini. What happened after that? What was the next company that you went to? I left Capgemini in 2003 to come to the university. So you've been in the university since 2003. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you then in in all of these proud moments, whether they involve the students, whether they involve you, whether they involve, you know, your children, it's all about that recognition of the journey and the celebration of success that you've managed to kind of then bring through into the celebration of your own success. So I like what you've done there. So when we're talking about success then, and this is the question that I ask everybody, at the end of the podcast, it's in your view, if you were going to, you know, put one or two things in, what would the secret to success be in the eyes of Dave Cooper? Okay. So I think one thing I would add is that I don't necessarily talk about success. I talk about sustainable success. Nice. And that's really important to me because it has to be success over the long term. And if we look at it within that context, then I would like to think I maintain curiosity. I'm always curious about what's Mm -hmm. going on. I'm optimistic. And you probably detect I've got fairly strong values, which I hold to. And those sort of consist of respecting the individual, working through my teams. I don't suppose that's uncommon to hear. 
but you enthuse them, mm. support them, and encourage them to be innovative. And I suppose I'm keen that we judge people and I expect myself to be judged not by what I say I do, but what I do. Mm. And a couple of years ago, we were going through a, just a workshop at the university. We were asked to articulate what a leader needs. And so I was asked this and everybody quite liked it. And I like it, actually. And I've got a poster of it. And it sort of says, every leader needs a big box of well done for our teams, a tin of persistence, a bottle of ambition, and a pack of tissues. <laughs> I'm loving that final edition. <laughs> persistence, definitely. You've also mentioned curiosity, which hasn't landed on the poster, but is one of the things I think helps to keep us safe from the point of view of, you know, quite often we're walking around fearful of making mistakes, fearful of not getting it right, fearful of saying the wrong thing. And, you know, I see people every day that that's happening and they're they're being held back. And actually curiosity becomes the key to unlocking that fear and allowing us to just go and find out without fear of some sort of retribution. So I love the fact that you've brought that word in. And you also talked about values and you then articulated your values. And I'm always surprised at how many people can't do that. And yet their values are being triggered daily and having an impact on their behavior. And so, you know, one of the easiest exercises we can do is actually sit down and figure out what the values are. And yet so many people don't do that. And it's quite 70s at one level because, you know, I used to do that on training courses back in the day. And yet people are blind to it. So it's really lovely to hear that you've brought that in and then that you can articulate what they are. And that would be something that people can take away along with your persistence and tissues. And what was the other one? Ambition. Ambition and a box of well done. Yeah. Oh, I love that. We all need that poster in our lives. Where can we download that poster, Dave? Is it available for download? <laughs> I can send it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need that in our lives. You're missing a trick there. It needs to be on the university website oh. that does. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how we can find out more about the university and what you have to offer. Well, the best way is just to have a look at the website, chai.ac.uk. Nice. Nice. Chai. I love the fact I've only just moved to Chichester, Dave, so I'm getting used to the fact that it's called Chai. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for letting us see some of the human behind the academic and for just, you know, sharing so nicely all the different aspects that you have today. It's been a joy. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and then into the weekend and take good care of you. That's very kind. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. And so, just like that, we're at the end of the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed your time listening today. And a big thank you from me for taking the time. I'd really love it if you would be able to leave a review because it really does help us to get noticed. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe and then you never miss an episode. I wish you a lovely rest of the day, whatever it is that you're doing. And I hope that you stay safe and well.